Okay, everybody. So this evening we're going to look at a uh, a subject that has uh, I've been very interested in for for some time. This is some we're going to look at some cross pollinization. We've been doing this with studying I and Thou with Martin Buber or by Martin Buber. And if you haven't seen those particular class recordings, you can check those out in the um, in another video. But this is this is going to actually focus on. So Martin Buber is was a Jewish theologian, and he he speaks from the Jewish tradition. And now we're going to look at the Christian tradition and how it understands this this importance of of relationship. And I'm and for this, this will probably be uh, two or maybe three different talks. Uh, so this will be the first. This is the first one, and I'm and I'm relying heavily on this particular book here called "A New Climate for Christology" by Sally McFaig. She's a uh, a Christian theologian. She's passed away now, a few just a few years ago, but she was a professor at I believe Yale Divinity School, maybe uh, no Vancouver School of Theology. Can you hold that book up again, please? Sure. Yeah, this one here. New Perfect. for Christology. Yeah, so she's a she was a professor at the Vancouver School of Theology in Vancouver, British Columbia. And before that, she was at Vanderbilt Divinity School. So she's written quite uh, a bit about God and 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 the natural world, and and she has a she she comes from a what we would call a feminist perspective on uh, theology. Uh, so I want to give a brief introduction to the a subject that she brings up here. I want to give a brief introduction to this this evening. And uh, towards the end, we'll tie it in with with some Buddhism. All right. So let me share my screen. is all right so i believe you can see my my um my any if you want to come over Let's see a little bit easier okay so um this has been this has been some time in the making i i sh i share this particular these particular teachings with with my world religions classes and I think for the most part they went it went over the head their heads it went way over their heads they were just so, it was just so out of the ballpark of what their experience and expectations of Christianity were that um, I'm not sure I, I think it could be it could be helpful though even if you don't fully understand it so what I'm doing here is attempting to to um, bring out the the basics of of what she's saying that could potentially be understandable by anybody, uh, whether you're you know a college student at 17 or you've been you know you have an interest in in meditation and and uh, maybe other things as well. So we're going to look at specifically here with uh, the ideas around the Trinity and a concept that she talks about called, uh, called, what is it? <laughs> um, kineticism, kineticism. So we'll look at that. Okay, so first let's, let's look at this. Uh, there's, a, there's a reluctance for people in the modern age to study religion uh, if you this doesn't does not apply to those this what i'm saying here doesn't apply to those who maybe are more fundamentalist christian or evangelical christian i think that some groups um, 
may feel that this that the study of religion is important. But I think for the majority of people, and at least in the United States, uh, religion is not a top priority. And things that we could point to to verify that it is not a top priority is that if you would ask, uh, you know, you, there may be other things I'm missing here, but if you would ask those who you know don't really prioritize religion, there there may be multiple reasons for that. But some of them might include. Now, I'm not saying this is all inclusive, but some of them might include these the ideas of a of a virgin birth. In, in for people in modern with modern sensibilities, uh, it's really hard to to get our minds wrapped around something like that. Miracles, walking on water, being you know, raising people from the dead through prayer, oneself being resurrected from the dead. Nobody in the modern world has actually witnessed, to my knowledge, people being, after being dead for three days, coming back to life. You might be able to make the case for that, though, um, and now that I say that, I mean, for the most part, that's really true. But now that I say that, there are some, uh, there's an interesting book that that you might be interested in. It's called um, Water and the Spirit or something like that by Maladoma Patrice, Patrice Maladoma. He is a, he's a indigenous person in the, in East, East in West Africa. And, um, it's a fascinating read to, to read about this, but anyways, it, it, this is off base for, for modern people, for the most part, right? Let's just say it's, it's a very hard sell, uh, ideas and miracles. Oh, and one of I think this is one of the attractions to Zen is that it doesn't focus. It, it says everything is a miracle, right? Every, you know, chopping wood and carrying water is a miracle. Uh, Dogen Zenji says, simply walking, you know, walking on the earth. Thich Nhat Hanh says this, walking on the earth is the miracle. If you can walk, period, that's a miracle. So, if, and if we can really uh, see the, the miracle of being alive in this moment and what Buddhism calls dependent co-origination, we can see that, wow, this, this, you know, what we're, if we really look deeply, we can appreciate life in a real, in a profound way, beyond having to believe in some extrasensory miracles happening. I think miracles, just as an aside, miracles, the idea of miracles was a way to catch people's attention. And we still, honestly, we still do that. We still use um, people's desire to see the extraordinary um, in our films. Right? In, in films, you, you see this all the time. Superhero movies, for example, uh, these, are, these are modern forms of miracles. So it's not that miracles are obsolete. It's just that when we, conf we know that when we're watching a movie, it's just a movie. <laughs> and I think that was the idea in pre-modern times is that you, know, you, you read the story and you, you realize it's a, it's a story, but we've conflated the our reality with with our imagination and desires for things to be magical and we've had a hard time separating those two things um okay so out of sync with science is another is another reason people might point to right? being out of sync with with uh, discoveries of science and also the need to address serious issues like climate change, like um, mass migration, uh, refugees, and uh, poverty. These things are addressed, I think, within some of the religious traditions, but we don't always hear about them. And I think that uh, this, this particular talk this, at this time is, is meant to inspire looking a little bit closer at how religions can get involved in addressing some of these issues. All right, so the old story, there's a, so Sally McFaig talks about there being two stories. 
that are present right now within Christianity. They, there's an old story and there's a new story. So the the old story, now this pyramid thing, I pulled this off of the internet. Uh, I found this one with the zombies at the top of the pyramid chain. <laughs> But that's you know that's that's my own that's that's my own sense of humor. So don't take that too seriously. But if we if we think about it, the old story, says that there's a hierarchy of being with the plants at the bottom of the of this pyramid, the animals, the second rung, then the humans at the top. Um, and actually, instead of zombies at the very top, you would have um, God. God would be at the highest pinnacle here from, a, from the old story perspective, all right? Uh, now this, this is gonna, I need to, need to go into this a little bit more at another time, but just to get that sense of, this is the way that I think um, people in pre-modern times viewed the world. And it's largely the way that we still continue to view the world today. We see ourselves as human beings as kind of the pinnacle of evolution. And, and so, uh, but there's also other ways of seeing, as you know, and, and uh, if we look through Zen eyes, for example, we see interdependence being the, the story. But the way that we live out our lives and the systems that within which we, we live in basically see humans at the top and animals below humans, plants below animals, the earth below the plants. Right? And so um, Sally McFig is saying that we need a new, we need a new story about who we are in light of, particularly in light of, of um, what's happening with our world, what's happening with climate change. We need a new way of understanding where we are in the in the larger scheme of things and that the old story is while while it has been functional and continues to be functional for the majority of people is actually not so helpful as we move into a new age where our climate is radically changing and we need to rethink our place in the world and this is going to this isn't going to happen overnight. This is going to happen just by listening to one talk. It's going to be happening by thinking about this stuff over time and and contemplating our under our place in the universe as it's being revealed through, to us through various religious traditions including certain forms of Christianity which she calls kenotic Christianity or kenosis through certain perspectives or understandings of the Trinity. And certainly Buddhism has a lot to, to add here, but so does science. So um, she's saying that a new story can be found in what she calls kenosis. I've, I've said this term already, and maybe it's uh, familiar to, to most people here. It, it, is, it is a term found primarily in the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. Um, keep in mind, there are three brand, main branches of Christianity, right? The ones that we are most familiar with in the United States are, as, as a whole, the Catholic Church is one branch, and then the Protestant Church is the other branch. And the Protestant Church includes um, evangelicals it includes quakers it includes lutherans and methodists and baptists and and non-denominational christians they all kind of get lumped into this particular branch called protestantism but there's a third branch of christianity and that is the the eastern orthodox church and this concept is found within that church and um, it's it's being resurrected by ecologists of uh, e uh, people who are concerned about religion and ecology. It's being resurrected as a as a concept that can be very helpful in our time. So, what is it? What is this concept kenosis? 
um, one way to think about it. It's a Greek term, it's a Greek concept. And it means self-sacrifice. It means self-sacrifice. Um, and when we think of that in light of, say, a religion like Christianity, um, there's a particular story around self-sacrifice, and that is, especially in the West and the United States, especially, this is strong notion that Jesus died for our sins, therefore we are saved. That's, the, that's kind of the, the storyline there. However, and particularly in the Protestant, in, 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 in some Protestant, not all, but some Protestant denominations, that's kind of the way of thinking about self-sacrifice, that Jesus' sacrifice uh, means that we are all saved if you take Jesus as your savior, right? Then you'll be saved because he sacrificed himself. Okay. With all due respect to that particular way of thinking, there's another way also found within the Christian church. It's, you can find it within some Protestant branches, you can find it in Catholicism, and you can find it in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that is that sacrifice, this idea of this notion of self-sacrifice is not something that only God does, but all of us do it kind of equalizes this idea it, it takes it it we, we tend to think of like only a god like jesus would or could willfully sacrifice themselves but this but i'm going to challenge us to think about this a little bit more deeply and that is every moment really we are con continually sacrificing ourselves. We are continually sacrificing ourselves in one way or another. And that, that, now, do we, see, we take this idea of self sacrifice very, very literally when it comes to religion. And that's why people just give up. And I'm requesting that we not take it too, I mean, it, it can be taken literally, but that's not the most powerful way to take it. That every moment of our existence, is a form of kenosis and the question is whether we as human beings are aligned with it or not right mentally we can we can psych ourselves out of the idea that we are sacrificing ourselves each moment um, but even animals are doing it right what would you eat for dinner <laughs> or for breakfast or whatever it was even if you were a vegetarian would you eat plant life is sacrificing itself for us animals are sacrificing themselves even if it's not for us it's for their young the spinach leaves the spinach plant for example i remember my my zen teacher talking about how when she was gardening and uh, she was with her teacher and she had been watering these spinach leaves there are these the spinach plant and she noticed the bigger leaves on the outside were were dying and she thought oh no and she tried watering it more and then a few days later she realized uh, the the plant wasn't dying it was just that it was giving rise to newer leaves and the older leaves were were uh were done and in a similar way there's some part of ourself that continues to slough off in order to feed the new. So we're constantly regenerating. And we can see that in terms of on the microcosmic level where the stomach lining transforms. It's completely new every what day, every two or three days. The stomach, the, the stomach muscle, the stomach uh, cells, the, the, the cells that line the stomach get recycled every couple of days. They're, they're one of the quickest ones. The, the, the cells on our skin also are constantly slopping off and there's new cells being generated. So if we look at this at a microscopic level, we're doing self-sacrifice, whether we realize it or not. That's the nature of reality. And it's happening on multiple levels. It's happening on the microscopic level, uh, Right? So, for example, plants feed on soil and rock. Think about that. The, 
um, animals leave their dung and then insects claim it and they generate all kinds of life out of that stuff. And we use it to, so, uh, we use dung to fertilize the fields here in Iowa, right? We get the cornfields, uh, you smell it in the air every certain times of the year. Uh, animals feed on plants, microbes and fungi feed on the animals and their waste, right? So on the smallest level, this is happening. And even the idea of evolution, as we understand it in, in scientific terms, is an example of kenosis or self-sacrifice in action. Previous modes of existence went extinct and gave rise to new forms of existence. You know, if we go back to the last extinction with the dinosaurs, the mammals were came about according to science and evolution, the mammals didn't have a chance to really thrive and uh, and diversify uh, and evolve to the way that they are. We see them today until the dinosaurs were no longer a significant presence on the planet. Uh, and there's been five of these mass extinctions happening and each mass extinction gives rise to a new form of life. This is a form of life itself is self is sacrificing itself. And in and on the highest level too, on like the biggest level, biggest order of, of the universe, uh, stars, stars go into supernova. I've just been studying this with my son talking about stars exploding and they give birth, they, they give birth to all the elements, especially iron. Iron is only forged in stars. We have, we talked about this last week, right? The iron in our blood was forged in a supernova, in, a, in, in the, in this in the uh, as the star um, burns its hydrogen atoms, it then uh, gets um, the gravitational pull pulls everything in and the, and the star heats up so hot that the hydrogen hydrogens fuse and become helium. And so helium is created and then it gets hotter and hotter and fuses uh, more a carbon is created. And, and then it gets, you know, before it goes into, or as it's going into supernova, iron is generated out of that heat. It's just incredible. But this is an example of, of self-sacrifice happening. So we, we, we got to get out of this idea that sacrifice is something uniquely human, unique to Christianity, unique to um, certain ideas of God. This is the nature of reality. Kenosis, sacrifice, is the nature of reality. It's not something that can be hoarded by one religion or one particular person who is, is uh, half God, half divine. It's the nature of reality. Right? Death leads to new life. This is both extraordinary and also ordinary. All right. Um, Now, I mentioned the idea of the Trinity, and I think we'll get into that uh, in the next, in the next um, talk on here. So hold that thought. I wanna tie this back into, um, into, uh, into Buddhism. And I wanna give an example of this from Islam too, because there, there's a, in the mystical tradition and in the Sufi tradition, they go into this, there's a poem I want to share with you that my teacher shared a long time ago with me, and it just blew my brains out. Um, Rumi, he says, for thousands and thousands of years, I was a rock, and then I died, and I became a plant. And for thousands and thousands of years, I was a plant, and then I died, and I became an animal. And for thousands and thousands of years, I was an animal and then I died and I became a human being. Tell me, what do I have to lose in dying? What do I have to lose in dying? So soak that in, take that, take that in and try to live by it. We have so much fear around dying and yet we do it all the time. It happens all the time. It's just the nature of reality. 
Um, and let's, let's circle this back to uh, Buddhist teachings, emptiness. All things interpenetrate each other. Right? That can't happen without, without death. All things are related. All things are connected. The idea of, of no self. The idea that without you, I don't exist. That's the Buddhist teaching. And, you know, these are just, you know, we can talk about this till we're blue in the face, but because these are just ideas meant to inspire us. They're really meant to inspire us to, to first think and think a little bit differently about our life. And then to live in such a way that that we live a, a, a life of letting go of the self, you know, in Buddhist terms would be letting go of the self, this identification with the self. Or how to be of service to others that we see ourselves as totally connected with with other other people with other animals and, you know, and, uh, you know, an example I could give for my own from my own uh, life that might be down to earth is gardening, right? Just getting out there and, and getting in the soil. You just, there's something wonderful about putting our hands in the soil and the smells of the earth, planting seeds, watering them. Uh, when we grow vegetables, you can, I, this morning I was pulling blueberries off of a blueberry bush that I planted like four years ago. It's like, wow, wow, this is wonderful, you know? And then I'm eating the blueberry and the blueberry is becoming a part of me. So we see that and we share, we share our food with others. Every time we sit down at a meal, we're sharing our food with others. Even if we're eating alone, we're sharing our food. You, you went to the store, you participated in an economy where people are sharing. You know, the, the exchange might be money, but there's there's a sharing taking place. So in any case, this is a, I think this will be a, the, the a, a introductory kind of talk on on this idea of Trinity, and we'll go into it a little bit more next time. Thank you. All right. So I want to give you guys an opportunity. Let me um, let me pause that here.